Good afternoon, Bethany. I am quite sure that you all know who I am, but in case you do not know, I am Marcia Roberson, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to another Bethany experience where you will receive spiritual fulfillment and treasure troves for the week ahead. It is our prayer that you will be blessed worshiping with us today and that you will be excited to revisit us in the near future. Again, welcome and remember, you do not have to be at Bethany to be with Bethany. Enjoy the rest of the worship service. Good afternoon and welcome back to our friends and family out there. I'm Pastor Guerrier, and I'm glad that you've decided to spend these next few moments with us. Now, before we continue with our worship experience, I just have a couple of announcements to share with you today. Now, today marks the final leg of our series through the book of Daniel. Over the past few weeks, we've been blessed with some great, powerful sermons from some very good speakers. We learned on the first week that God, through our trials, wants Jesus to shine the brightest within us. We also learned that when we are faced with systems of unrighteousness and injustice, not only are we supposed to refrain from that, but God empowers us to make a difference, to shatter the system. We also learned that when we are faced with pressure cooker situations, there is a lion within that God has developed. And there is also a lion from above, Jesus, the lion from the tribe of Judah, who comes in and the devil just has to back out of the way. And I'm happy for what we're about to learn today as well from our very special guest speaker. Now this upcoming month of September, promises to be a very interesting month. We can be certain to hear a lot of noise around us. Our children, most of them at least, will be headed back to school. And it seems like everything is hyper-politicized these days. Speaking of politics, the presidential election is coming up. And we know that there'll be a lot of uncertainty and a lot of confusion. But there's one thing that you and I can be certain of. That's the God who's always been in control, is still in control, and will be in control during, after November 3rd, and beyond. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about during the month of September, about a God who is in control. So look out for our sermons, for our prayer meetings, for our services that will center around a God who we know will be in control. And speaking of God being in control, you and I still have an opportunity every week to show God just how much we love and trust Him. Now, I know the building is closed, but the people, the children, the Church of Christ is still here and still empowered and expected to do the work that God requires that we do. So in the description box, there's information as to how you can be faithful with your tithes and offering to support the cause and Church of Christ. And also there's a lockbox at the back of 962 Prospect Avenue where you can personally deliver your tithes and your offering. Now I'm happy to reintroduce to most and introduce to some the speaker who will bring the word to us today, Pastor Gregory Nelson, Associate Pastor of the Mount Vernon Seventh-day Adventist Church is here with us. I know that you will enjoy this powerful word as we conclude our series in Daniel Enjoy your worship experience with us.
Good afternoon, Bethany, and happy Sabbath. It's prayer time. Number six, verse 24 through 26 says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. This afternoon, we are praying for peace to cover your lives, to fill your hearts and to fill your homes. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for being the great God that you are. God, in the midst of all uncertainty during this time of pandemics and issues in our community of social injustice and racial inequality, Father, we can turn to you for security and for guidance. Father, in a special way, I ask that you place your covering over our nation, place your covering over our world. Bless the leaders, bless those who are on the front lines, who are aiding and helping patients, who are sick and trying to get through. Father, you know the way. You are the light, the truth, and you can shine the light that we need in our communities right now. Father, in our church, Lord, there are so many different issues that are present, Lord Father, whether it may be family issues, maybe financial issues, whatever the issue may be, Father, we lay it at your feet right now because we know that in your care, God, anything is possible. So God, we claim your promises and we claim your truth. Thank you so much for dying on the cross for us, God. You lay down your life so that we may have life and have it more abundantly. Right now in this space, in this time, Lord, someone may be struggling. Someone may be dealing with some issues in their lives right now, Father. Lord, be the great God, the mighty God, the healing God, the delivering God that you are and be with this individual right now. Cover them in the name of Jesus. Allow them to feel your support all around them, Father. Lord, we ask that in the name of Jesus, that you come quickly. There's so many things happening all around us, but we know that in you, we will find our rest and we will find our peace. Until that day that you come, Lord God, we ask that you strengthen us and keep us as we continue to walk and move forward each and every day. We pray in the holy, matchless name of Jesus. Let everybody say, Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I'm so glad to be in this space with you guys today. So glad to be serving a risen Savior. Please come and worship with us today. rescued my life and I'm never going back you have rescued my life you have rescued my life and I'm never going My response is 
Hallelujah, you're my Redeemer. Hallelujah, my response is Hallelujah, you're my Redeemer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, you're my redeemer. 
Redeemer. Hallelujah. My response is Hallelujah. You're my Redeemer. Hallelujah. Giving honor to God, who is the head of my life, and uh, to his son, Jesus the Christ, uh, for saving my soul and giving to me salvation full and free. I want to take this opportunity to also thank the pastor of the Bethany Seventh-day Adventist Church, my friend and colleague, your pastor, uh, Pastor Reginald Guerrier. I want to thank God for his friendship, and I want to thank him for uh, his uh, leadership, his mentorship the things that he's taught me, the things that he's shown me. Um, I want to thank God that he uh, was strategically placed in my life at a very dark season and that uh, because of his help, I was able to make it through some of the things that were really stressing me out. Uh, church, you really do have in Pastor Gary a, a gem and a treasure. Uh, I want you to continue to support him, pray with him and for him. Uh, let him lead you as the Lord shall lead him. And I promise you, you will go from height to height and from glory to glory. Man of God, I celebrate you and I celebrate God for you. And I celebrate the people that God has given you to lead and to manage and to instruct in all righteousness. Amen, amen, and amen. At this time, saints of God, will you turn in your Bibles to the word of the Lord as we find it? in the book of Daniel and the fifth chapter. Daniel chapter five, Daniel chapter five. And we're looking at verses one to six. Daniel chapter five, one to six. Uh, and uh, I will read in your hearing. The Bible says, Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines drank in them. The Bible says they drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. The Bible says in the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees smote one another. I'd like to summon your senses and invite your intellect to consider God's admonition to this body for the next few moments under the subject, the handwriting is on the wall. Uh, Saints of God, if you just give me a few moments, I'd like to make my case that the handwriting is on the wall. Will you pray with me? Our Father and our God, we give you praise, honor, and glory. We declare and decree that there is no God like our God. We ask you now to clear your throat, speak your mind, and have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. It is said that God works in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. And if there were ever an incident that makes true this common saying, then our story recorded in Daniel 5 is it. For when we arrive in Daniel 5, when we arrive at our sacred scripture, we are immediately given optical access to the banquet hall of King Belshazzar. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the melodious sounds of masterful music fills the air while rare delicacies and culinary delights are being served. Large and ornate victuals filled with the devil's nectar serve to intoxicate intoxicate the masses, the masses and inoculate them to the fact that they wield power and privilege that allows them to revel in the excess of today's festivities. The Bible tells us that Belshazzar has thrown this latest shindig in honor of about a thousand of his lords. Already infatuated and inebriated, he commands the sacred relics stolen from the temple of God in Jerusalem to be paraded throughout the hall. They ought to be filled with food and drink offered to idols and then desecrated in romp and revelry to satiate his appetite for empty praise and hollow worship. Ah, oh, beloved, how arrogant, how egomaniacal and pretentious, how hubristic and pig-headed. How insolent and imperious. How presumptuous. Belshazzar has thrown caution to the wind and has defiantly dared to invoke the rage and the wrath of Almighty God. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, but as sudden as it had begun, Belshazzar's blowout comes screeching to an untimely halt as a bloodless hand reaches through the sleeve of night, stretching forth its finger to write on the wall, your time is up. Ladies and gentlemen, scripture records that this epiphanal outburst has a profound effect on Belshazzar as the joints of his knees are loosed and they begin to knock one against another. In other words, Belshazzar is so shook that he's literally scared out of his mind. This dramatic move of God serves to remind Belshazzar that God is going to have the final say and that at the appointed hour, God will speak his mind. He is informed that the judgment of God may be delayed, but it is not denied. He comes to find out that God may at times keep silent while evil prospers and while workers of iniquity have their way. But his word is still true, and the rod of the wicked shall not rest upon the lot of the righteous. Ladies and gentlemen, God still commands his people to not fret over evildoers, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. I promise you, I'm in the Bible. Isaiah 13, 11, thus says God, I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will also put an end to the arrogance of the proud and abase the haughtiness of the ruthless. Oh, y'all don't, don't believe me, church. Psalm 34, 21, the Bible says, evil shall slay the wicked and those who hate righteousness will be condemned. Y'all still ain't persuaded. Isaiah 3, 11, woe to the wicked. I will go, it will go badly for him, the Bible says, for what he deserves will be done to him. Y'all still ain't convinced. Job 34, 26 and 27, he striketh them as wicked men in open sight of others because they turned back from him and would not consider any of his ways. Ah, oh, church, I rose today to tell the people of God, God will not remain silent about iniquity forever. God will not ignore evil forever. God will not sit idly by forever. God will not hold back his judgment forever. And so church, today's message strikes at the heart of what we're experiencing in the world right now. Because here is a truth that is inescapable. The wicked have been prospering for a long time now. Iniquity has had its way. Lawlessness abounds. Wickedness is paraded without shame. And evil is flaunted with no remorse. I'm preaching here 
morality is abhorred and decency is reviled while compassion is castigated and meekness is denigrated. Have I got a witness in this house that we live in an upside down world where excess is celebrated, corruption is rewarded, oppression is normalized and guile is extolled. Ladies and gentlemen, kings and princes gather together in opulent spaces. They laugh. They laugh the poor and the indigent to scorn. They villainize those whom they have oppressed and they demonize those whom they have dispossessed. Ladies and gentlemen, I declare to you that in 2020, public servants violate their oaths of office and civil servants manhandle those they've been sworn to protect. Public officials continue to promote private agendas and the haves continue to deprive the have-nots. Oh, church, we're living in strange times. I remember a day when, by and large, people agreed to the evilness of a thing. And even if we liked the person who was perpetrating it, we could all come together and agree that what they were doing was out of order. We agreed that what they were doing was outside of the norm. We agree that it violated accepted convention. We agree that it was inappropriate and generally unacceptable. Ah, oh, but church, those days are long gone. It seems to me that society has totally rejected notions of right and wrong. And no matter how egregious the act, it can be justified. No matter how filthy the deed, it can be sanitized. All of the rules that keep society functioning in an orderly way are being thrown out and lawlessness rules the day. The wicked no longer feel the need to do what they do under the cover of darkness. They do it in the sight of the masses. And often they find the loftiest and most elevated perch to display their disdain for what is right. They boldly declare, I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and not lose any voters. How low we have gone. And how low have we gone? The guilty are pardoned. <laughs> Protesters are gassed and bombed. Children are placed in cages. Mexicans are labeled as criminals. I'm preaching now. Charities are looted. Muslims are banned. Democratic governors and mayors supposedly lead rat-infested cities. Lies are repeated without fear of contradiction. Justice is up for sale. Voting is attacked. Russia is embraced. Criminals are promoted. Incompetence is rewarded. Meanness is a virtue. A virus is killing people. And there has been no real response from the federal government. And all the while, Christians who should be representing the Lord God are either silent or openly complicit. Our church, like Belshazzar did when he trotted out the choice vessels for temple worship that were stolen from Jerusalem and used them as props for his party. The word of God and the people of God are trotted out by a mad demagogue and endorse all kinds of immorality, the kinds that would make heaven cringe. Oh, but saints of God, I hear God saying, Hear me well, Belshazzar. I have had enough. I've been patient long enough. I hear God saying you've reached the limits of my patience and now your cup is running over. Unless we get it twisted and begin to think that I'm blaming everything wrong in the world and everything wrong in the country on Donald Trump and his administration. Let me fix it for you. Uh, the princes of America have been partying for a long time. The kings, potentates, and prelates have been enjoying their lives at the expense of decency for a long time. And while the presidency of Donald Trump is a recent phenomenon, the spirit that gave rise to it is not. I think I ought to preach right here because Donald Trump is America. Uh, racism is America. Oppression is America. I'm preaching right. Uh, violence is America, 
I know some of us want to say that he, talking about Donald Trump, is an anomaly. He's a one-off. He's the exception and not the rule. But the truth is, Donald Trump is in public now what America has been in public for a long time. The same framers who wrote into the Constitution that all men are created equal then turned around and said that black men and white men are not the same and that black men and black women are three-fourths of humans, three-fourths of a human being. This is the same country that murdered millions of Native Americans, that kidnapped millions of black men and women from the shores of Africa and made them become slaves here in the Americas. These, amen, are the people who lynched thousands of their own citizens and set up laws that protected slave owners while condemning millions to die inhumane deaths. And so I believe it is the height of irony and the pinnacle of hypocrisy to hear people talk about this current administration as violating the core values of America, when in fact, the president is living up to the core values of America. But I rose to tell somebody today, God says, pay attention, Belshazzar. Pay attention, America. Pay attention, white evangelicals. Pay attention, Seventh-day Adventist Church. Pay attention, regional conference presidents. The handwriting is on the wall. This party is coming to an end. Mene, mene, tekel, ufarsin. You have been weighed in the scales and you have been found wanting. Ladies and gentlemen, the handwriting is on the wall and it suggests that we've reached a day when God is about to bring the curtain down on this sin show. God is about to execute judgment on workers of iniquity. God is about to deal with power and principalities, and the rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. I declare and decree the handwriting is on the wall. And in the time that I have left, I'd like to suggest to you three reasons today. Three reasons that the handwriting is on the wall, and then I'm going to sign off. Can I do that, church? I'd like to suggest three reasons that the handwriting is on the wall, and then I'm going to my seat. So first of all, the handwriting is on the wall because here it is, the reminders of the past were dismissed. I'm saying to you, and I'm making the case that the handwriting is on the wall because the reminders of the past were dismissed. See, Belshazzar and his host forgot the lessons that history had taught them. They forgot how God had humbled Nebuchadnezzar and cast him down to live like an animal and eat grass for seven years. They forgot, church, that God has a way of humbling the proud and casting down the arrogant. You see, Belshazzar's act at the party was an attempt to brag and boast about who he was and what he had accomplished. Parenthetically, uh, Belshazzar had built nothing uh, he was living off of his father and grandfather's success. Uh, sounds eerily familiar, doesn't it? Amen. Uh, he didn't really do anything. Uh, he just tried to slap his name on some stuff. Uh, amen. And claim about how great he was and how many great companies he had. I'm preaching. Uh, uh, Belshazzar had forgotten how God had intervened to teach his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, about his own sovereignty when three Hebrew boys were cast into a fiery furnace and the fourth man, the God man, showed up in order to rescue them. Ladies and gentlemen, we come to learn, uh, amen, through Belshazzar, that those, uh, amen, who forget the lessons of the past are doomed to repeat them. And let me tell you something. We serve a God who will find a way to remind those who forget what he has already declared. And that's why I'm convinced even now in the world and particularly in America, the handwriting is on the wall. Why? Because we've seemingly forgotten that the Lord is the one who reigns and rules. We've forgotten that all of us, irrespective of our money, irrespective of our technological advances, irrespective of our military might, all of us must answer to a higher power. 
and that God's will will be exercised whether we like it or not. Ladies and gentlemen, we as a country have forgotten that God is a God of justice who identifies with the oppressed. I'm preaching the word of God. We have forgotten the truth that God revealed to us in the person of that great civil rights icon, Martin Luther King Jr., when he said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Ladies and gentlemen, the oppressed believe that their reign will last forever and that there is nothing and no one who can challenge them. Oh, but church, I declare to you that when people forget who God is, God will find a strange way of reminding them. And so today the handwriting is on the wall. But watch this. The second reason the handwriting is on the wall is because the realities of the present were diminished. Okay, I said that the lessons of the past, amen, the lessons of the past, the lessons that God had taught them, amen, and the reminders of the past were dismissed. But the second reason that the handwriting is on the wall is that the realities of the present were diminished. See, at a time when the Persian army was surrounding and besieging the city, Belshazzar should have been praying and seeking God. His great-grandfather or his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, has already taught us, amen, that there comes a time where we've got to bow the knee before God. He said, there's a fourth in the fiery furnace, and that fourth one looks like the son, amen, of the living God. Belshazzar should have remembered Nebuchadnezzar's counsel and his advice. He should have been doing the work of introspection and analysis, he should have been calling the people to sobriety and repentance. He should have been examining ways that he could avoid this impending doom. But while his world was about to come crashing down, he was busy at the golf course. I mean, he, he was busy partying. Yeah, yeah. He was busy, busy dancing and drinking. He was busy texting and tweeting. I'm preaching, right? And might I suggest that what we're witnessing in America today is a result of, amen, the spirit of Belshazzar, uh, amen, because while this economy is in shambles and while police officers are gunning down unarmed men and women in broad daylight and while protesters are marching and rioters are burning and destroying businesses and professional sports leagues and games have been canceled and the rule of law has been abandoned and Congress can't even pass a simple amen stimulus package and meaningful legislation has been halted and a global pandemic has claimed over 180,000 lives. Our orange face commander in chief continues to tweet out attacks, tweet out lies and falsehoods and promote divisive rhetoric. Saints. Just because we ignore what's going on does not mean that the reality will change. And just because we ignore the sick and the dying, just because we want to slow down testing and we don't want to enforce wearing of masks does not mean that this pandemic is not raging. I declare and decree we've got to see the world the way it really is and engage the present reality irrespective of how uncomfortable we are with it. And while I'm on the subject, don't think I'm just coming for politics and politicians. Let me speak to the Adventist church. Let me speak to us, the people of God, because many of us want to stop talking about the current reality. We're tired of hearing about social justice and racial inequality. We don't want to hear another word about Black Lives Matter. And, and we don't want to hear, amen, about standing up against, uh, amen, racial injustice and, uh, and oppression, uh, uh, but we cannot escape today's inconvenient reality. This, what we're going through is present truth. While we are still preparing for the second coming, we cannot abandon the focus of Jesus and his ministry because while we have at times failed 
in our religious experience to side with his agenda while we ignore social justice and pit it against the second coming. I declare to you that that kind of behavior is problematic because it fails to recognize that Jesus talked more about social justice than he even talked about heaven. Do the research. The God we serve is a God of justice and we cannot continue to declare in our affirmations, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven without trying to push God's agenda right here on earth. And so the handwriting is on the wall because ladies and gentlemen, the reality of the present is diminished. I said to you, first of all, the handwriting is on the wall because the reminders of the past were dismissed. Secondly, the handwriting is on the wall because the realities of the present were diminished. But thirdly, I'd like to suggest to you that the handwriting is on the wall because the revelations concerning the future were denied. I'm preaching here. The last reason the handwriting is on the wall it's because revelations concerning the future were denied. And to understand how Belshazzar has rejected God's revelation about the future, you've got to go back to his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, and what he did. Because Belshazzar's, amen, stupidity is an extension of Nebuchadnezzar's folly. See, in Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar is given a vision of successive kingdoms that will come to prominence on the world stage. He's shown the image of a statue with various pieces of metal, different metals and earth elements that comprise the different pieces of the statue. The head is made of gold while the subsequent pieces are made of silver, brass, iron, ore, and clay. The various metals and earth elements represent different kingdoms who rise to prominence, succeeding one another. One another, but watch this. The kingdom of Babylon is the first part of the image and the head is made of gold. It's a clear word from God to Nebuchadnezzar that his reign and rule will come to an end and that there will be subsequent nations who will come to prominence after him. Ah, oh, but church, when Nebuchadnezzar decides to recreate the image, he makes the entire image out of gold. In other words, watch this. Nebuchadnezzar is recasting God's clear revelation, and this is his way of overriding the future that God has declared and supplanting it with his own will and desire. And watch this. Belshazzar now, his grandson, is operating in the same vein because to his mind, in spite of what's going on really in the world, Babylon will last forever. The Medes and the Persians are on the come up, but Babylon will last forever. In other words, Belshazzar is projecting his will over God's wisdom and his rationalization over God's revelation. And could it be, beloved, that today the handwriting is on the wall because America refuses to acknowledge that there is coming a day when her prominence will come to an end. Uh, there's coming a day when the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And could it be, church, that the handwriting is on the wall because by and large, America chooses patriotism over the potentate and flags over faith and the republic over righteousness. Oh, child of God, the handwriting is on the wall. And for many in this country, that's a sad fact. Ah, oh, but for the believer, it ought to be a sobering reality. We ought to rejoice in the fact that God's judgment is coming because it serves to affirm that God's word is true and that our hope in him is not misplaced. Ah, oh, church, the handwriting on the wall means that God is still in control. Have I got a witness here? Uh, Oh, ladies and gentlemen, it means that his will will come to pass and that time and eternity are in his hands. The handwriting on the wall speaks to you and speaks to me 
and informs us that he that shall come will come and he will not tarry. As a matter of fact, I'd like to declare that the handwriting on the wall is song service. Okay, y'all ain't feeling me here. Uh, some of y'all looking at me funny. Y'all looking at the screen a little funny right here uh, because all you know is praise and worship. But I said it, handwriting on the wall is song service because long before we had awesome praise and worship songs, we had hymns that we sung in song service. And the handwriting on the wall, church, <laughs> it's singing to us today. Uh, Tis almost time for the Lord to come. I hear the people say, the stars of heaven are growing dim. It must be the breaking of the day. Our oh, ladies and gentlemen, the handwriting on the wall sings to us today. What does it sing, preacher? The golden morning is fast approaching. Jesus soon will come to take his people and happy children to their promised home. Y'all ain't feeling me yet here. Oh, we see the gleams of the golden morning piercing through the night of gloom. Oh! We see the gleams of the golden morning that will burst the tomb. Oh, child of God, will you shout with me? The handwriting is on the wall. That means that God's final word is about to be declared and God's angelic host is about to descend. I heard the old hymnologist sing, lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. Cheer Cheer up, ye pilgrims, be joyful and sing. Jesus is coming again. Ladies and gentlemen, the handwriting is on the wall. And because of that fact, we ought to sing. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In those mansions, bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. Y'all ain't happy yet. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Ah! When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Ladies and gentlemen, the handwriting is on the wall. And because the handwriting is on the wall, we ought to declare it may be at morn when the day is awaking, when sunlight through darkness and shadow is breaking, that Jesus will come in the fullness of glory to receive from the world his own. Oh, Lord Jesus, how long, how long till we shout the glad song? Christ returneth, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm reminded that in our passage, Belshazzar and the gathered host, amen, are blessed to see the handwriting on the wall. And when an interpreter is needed, Daniel is summoned to interpret what the message says. It's a message of judgment for Belshazzar, but it will ultimately result in liberation for God's people, for God's people. Because as we come to find out, the next king that's coming up, Darius, king of Persia, he's going to be the one who serves out the edict. He's going to be the one who returns the children of God back to their home to rebuild their temple and to rebuild their nation. And as I I prepare to close. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to let you know the handwriting uh, is on the wall. Uh, the signals uh, have already been given. Uh, God uh, is about to do his thing. As I close the message today, I'm strangely drawn to baseball. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't really watch baseball all that much. Uh, I only watch it during the pennant and uh, during the last few weeks, amen, when the guys are trying to make a run for the championship, and especially if the Yankees are playing, amen. Mets, y'all all right, but I'm a Yankee man. Uh, uh, but, but I think about baseball. Uh, uh, one of the things that's a part of the culture of baseball are hand signals, hand signals, yeah. Uh, they're all over the field. They're communicating with each other. Signals, uh, amen, are being sent out. And one of the signals uh, that is most watched in baseball is when the manager signals to the runner, when the base coach signals to the runner on third base uh, to run for home and so and score. And so I need you to get this. Uh, the, 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 the signal that we're watching the most uh, is when the manager, amen, over the third base line uh, is waving the runner on to go home and score. Uh, uh, the, the manager gives him the hand signal and waves him on home. Well, at the party in our text, uh, 
the guest saw only a man's hand writing a message and giving a signal. It was a signal uh -huh, that time was up and that Belshazzar was going to lose his home. Okay, I, I, I hope you're happy now. I'm getting ready to leave you now, church. I'm about to sign off now. But my Bible tells me that someday soon, you and I will also experience a hand. We're going to see a cloud the size of a man's hand and that hand sized cloud is going to be a signal a signal from God standing over the third baseline to wave us on home can I preach it like I feel it come on home my child that's the signal we're going to see come on home and enter into the joy of thy Lord come on home my child you who are weary and worn come on home ye blessed of my father come on home you good and faithful servants. Uh, I wish I had a church right through here. Uh, come on home, sons and daughters of the Most High God. Uh, come on home, my little children. Uh, come on home, you weary pilgrims. Uh, come on home, uh, you wayfaring strangers. Uh, I hear Jesus calling us now, church. Uh, softly and tenderly, uh, Jesus is calling, uh, calling for you and for me. Uh, see, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on his portals, uh, he's waiting and watching, uh, waiting uh, and watching for you and me. Uh, he says today, come on home. Uh, you who are weary, uh, come home. Ladies and gentlemen, the handwriting is on the wall. And it's telling us that he that shall come will come and will not carry. So don't forget about the lessons from the past. Don't overlook the, cover, the current realities. And don't neglect the future that has been declared because soon and very soon we're going to see the king. Is there anybody here under the sound of my voice who believes the word of God today that the handwriting is on the wall? The prophecies in the word of God all reveal to us that time is winding up. And for those of you who are reading the tea leaves, for those of you who are seeing the signs of the times, it's time to promote God's agenda. It's time to be about the work of the kingdom. It's time to get our lives in order. And I'm not just talking about private piety. I'm talking about communal righteousness, pushing God's agenda in the world, standing up like the song says, stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high the royal banner. It must not suffer loss. Who am I speaking to today? The word of the Lord to you today is the handwriting is on the wall. Mene, mene tekel who farsin. You have been weighed in the scales, believers, and we've been found wanting. It's time to ante up and get right with God. It's time to be about the business of the kingdom. It's time to order our lives and make God our priority. But seek ye first, the Bible says. The kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. I wonder if there's anybody under the sound of my voice who believes that the handwriting is on the wall and you want to get your life right with the Lord Jesus Christ. You want to make heaven your priority and the things of God your focus. You want to say today, preacher, I see the handwriting on the wall. I don't want to be like Belshazzar caught unaware, but I want to see the handwriting and so govern my life as to be ready for the king who is soon to come. If that's your desire today, if you're responding to this appeal today, and if you want to say, I want to give control, absolute and total control of my life to the Lord, I see the handwriting on the wall and I want to be ready when the king shall appear. If that's you, eyes are closed and heads are bowed. Our Father and our God, we give you praise and thanks today because the handwriting is on the wall. We cannot, Lord God, lie to ourselves and tell ourselves that everything is going to be well because every signal that we're reading, every signal from the kingdom of heaven suggests that Jesus is soon to come. Father, please do not allow us to be so overwhelmed with the iniquity that we see around us that we get weary in well-doing but give to us a strong desire from heaven 
to remain locked into the kingdom, to see the handwriting on the wall and make our lives and bring our lives into harmony with your will. Father, thank you for this sermon. Thank you for this word. Thank you for this challenge. Lord, for Belshazzar, time was up. For us, it's a warning to be ready. And so God, we heed your word and we heed your warning today. We thank you for what has been done in this service. Father, help us to connect with a local body of believers. I know church buildings and church doors are closed, but Father, there are churches in our local communities, local Adventist churches. Father, I pray that we will seek out those local churches, connect with those bodies of believers, strengthen each other as we see the day approaching. And when you shall come, all of us will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. This is what we pray and ask in the name of Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen.